We noted in the last video that the key to understanding radical structure and stability trends is to recognize that they're for the most part electron deficient, so their stability trends mirror those of carbocations. We're going to see that in more detail in this video. And we're also going to look at bond dissociation enthalpies, which give us insight into stability trends as well and provide the empirical evidence for the stabilities of radicals, as we'll see. The cleavage of single bonds to generate radicals is what initiates radical reactions. And since this follows naturally from discussions of bond dissociation enthalpies, we'll end this video with a discussion of the initiation of radical reactions. Because radicals are electron deficient species, they're stabilized by the same things that stabilize carbocations. Inductive donation, here primarily alkyl groups, are the major contributors to this. Resonance donation from lone pairs or pi bonds adjacent to the radical center. Lower electronegativity of the atom bearing the unpaired electron and more p character in the h orbital housing the unpaired electron, and we saw that in the last video. Because alkyl groups donate electron density to the electron-deficient radical center, the most substituted radicals are the most stable. Tertiary radicals bearing three alkyl groups are the most stable, followed by secondary radicals, primary radicals, and the methyl radical, which is the least stable in this series. When it comes to resonance, any structural feature that delocalizes the radical density, that is, puts radical character on more than one atom, is going to stabilize the molecule. For example, we might compare the allyl radical, which bears a double bond adjacent to a radical center that appears to be primary, with a primary radical like the ethyl radical that lacks resonance. Internal electron flow in the allyl radical shows us that the unpaired electron is delocalized over the two end carbons of this molecule. Just as if the radical electron were a charge, the delocalization of radical density stabilizes this molecule relative to the ethyl radical. We see the same idea in action in radicals adjacent to oxygen or nitrogen. In this case, the lone pair can get involved in resonance, showing that the radical character is delocalized over carbon and the heteroatom. And just to really drive home this point, it's the sharing of the radical character on multiple atoms that stabilizes resonance active radicals like this. This is just another application of the electron delocalization idea that we've seen in a resonance context previously. Finally, it's worth mentioning electronegativity. In general, especially when we're looking at atoms within the same period or row of the periodic table, more electronegative atoms are associated with less stable radicals. And this is, again, because radicals are electron deficient species. So if we compare a carbon radical to a nitrogen radical and so on along the second row of the periodic table, we find that as the electronegativity of the atom bearing the radical character increases, the radical becomes less stable. This trend doesn't exactly work if we look down groups because as atoms get bigger, their bonds tend to get weaker and the formation of radicals becomes somewhat more likely, as we'll see in the next segment of this video. Cleaving a bond between two atoms X and Y homolytically to give rise to a pair of radicals is an endothermic process that requires an investment of energy. The atoms would rather be bonded to each other than not bonded each to each other with unpaired electrons. And so there's an uphill climb in energy required to make this process occur. The amount of energy required to do this is referred to as the bond dissociation enthalpy, or BDE. We've already seen how we can use BDEs to determine the thermodynamic favorability of a reaction, but BDEs can also give us insight into radical stability. The general idea here is to look at a series of bond dissociation energies in which we're keeping, say, x constant and we're systematically varying y. Since the only change as we systematically vary the y group is the structure of the y radical and the structural features of this extremely unstable species are going to dictate this energy difference, we can gain insight about the stability of the y radical from this series of bond dissociation enthalpies. This provides us with insight into radical stability trends and really serves as an empirical basis since these bond dissociation enthalpies are measured enthalpy changes for homolytic cleavage. Here's a table of bond dissociation enthalpies for a series of bonds. And in the first section of the table, you can see that we've kept H constant through most of these and just varied the fragment to which H is attached. One thing to appreciate before we get into the table is that higher bond dissociation enthalpies, that is, a greater investment of energy required to break a bond homolytically means that the radical that we're systematically varying across this series is less stable. It's higher in energy, or in this particular case, higher in enthalpy. 
Using these ideas, we can see the stability trends that we've discussed already in these numbers. For example, let's compare the carbon radicals on the left-hand side of the table. The methyl radical has the highest BDE and is the least stable. The ethyl radical, which is primary, is somewhat more stable than the methyl radical. The isopropyl radical, which is generated when the secondary CH bond in propane undergoes homolytic cleavage, is somewhat more stable than the primary ethyl radical, and the tert-butyl radical, in which the radical carbon is tertiary, is the most stable within this series. The dependence of radical stability on electronegativity is even more stark in this table. If we compare the carbon radical to the nitrogen radical and the oxygen radical, we see that as the electronegativity of the radical bearing atom increases, the bond dissociation enthalpy increases, meaning the radical stability goes down, the radical gets less stable. Focusing on propene, the compound right here, we can also see the influence of resonance on radical stability. The BDE of this CH bond, which would give rise to a resonance stabilized radical, is significantly lower than the BDE of, for example, ethane. The lower BDE over here reflects resonance stabilization of the radical product of homolytic cleavage. And finally, we can also see the influence of the hybridization of the orbital bearing radical character in these two examples along with, say, ethane, as we go from an sp radical to an sp2 to a pure 2p radical, we get significant stability. The last thing to mention here are the remarkably low bond dissociation enthalpies for some of these symmetric bonds between heteroatoms, OO, CLCL, and BRBR. These numbers are significantly lower than bond dissociation enthalpies associated with CH bonds and even NH and OH bonds across the board. That means that these molecules are good candidates for generating radicals to kick off radical reactions. Homolytic cleavage of very weak bonds like this provides a tiny concentration of radicals that kick off radical reactions, and so homolytic cleavage is typically the first step of a radical mechanism. For example, the OO bond in peroxides can break homolytically to produce two peroxy radicals. The elemental halogens are also famous for this kind of reactivity. This typically requires light or heat to do in a significant amount, in an amount that gives a reasonable reaction rate, for example. But because the bonds linking the bromines and chlorines are relatively weak, thermodynamics is on our side. We can generate a useful amount of these radical species via homolytic cleavage. One last radical initiator that I'll mention here is the very large and unwieldy looking azobis isobutyronitrile, or AIBN. This clearly doesn't look like a molecule that has a weak bond within it. It's full of carbon-carbon, carbon-nitrogen, carbon-hydrogen bonds. But it's got a couple of features that lead to the production of stabilized radicals. If these carbon-nitrogen bonds break homolytically, we end up with, first of all, resonance stabilized radicals at these carbons. Notice that we can engage the triple bonds next door in resonance to delocalize the radical character. Additionally, homolytic cleavage produces a new triple bond between the central nitrogens, and the molecule that results is diatomic nitrogen, which is, of course, a gas. And so homolytic cleavage in AIBN produces a gas irreversibly that leaves the reaction mixture, leaving these radicals behind to initiate radical reactions. Initiation is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to radical mechanisms. In the next video, we'll look at radical chain mechanisms from a broad perspective and talk about the early stages of these reaction mechanisms.